The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Jason Lank in studio. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot to get to today. Election Day is now exactly two weeks away. And a question we're hearing a lot from investors recently is what impact will the election have on the market? And I think because this has been such a contentious election, and it seems like the media has really covered this election closer than ever before, and of course, we do have some very polarizing candidates involved, uh, investors are a bit nervous right now. And so over the next several weeks on the show, we're going to be covering the election from the standpoint of your portfolio. Today, we'll be joined by iShares Investment Strategist, Tushar Yadava, he's going to talk about some of the potential investment implications of the election. Uh, then on November 8th, which is Election Day, Todd Rosenbluth, Director of ETF and Mutual Fund Research at S&P Capital, he's going to discuss the election and ETFs that might be impacted. And, and then finally, the week after the election, Mike Strain, Director of Economic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. This is one of the big think tanks in Washington, D.C., He's going to recap the election and talk about the potential economic impact. But, Jason, this has no doubt been a very interesting election cycle. And I do think investors seem a bit more on edge than usual. It's been an interesting, uh, certainly, last three debates, the final just a few days ago. Um, you know, we've all seen the SNL parodies of those. It's, it's some funny stuff. But, you know, as, as, an, as a fiduciary to our client accounts, no matter who takes office, we're responsible for monitoring and advancing our client interests and in, in their accounts. But no question, uh, a polarizing, a pair of polarizing candidates, you know, there is debate whether, you know, each party has advanced the best and brightest they have, or maybe the system has changed and attitudes of the public are changing. You know, we'll just have to wait and see. With that said, uncertainty surrounding presidential elections isn't new. We, we have had many contentious elections over the course of our country's history. One of the reasons I, I personally think that we've seen so much attention is the advent of social media and the growth. I agree. You know, if you don't know what the term what's trending now means, you know, you're under a rock, you know, with Facebook and Twitter and Periscope, those have really provided and changed the filter with which we, we, we view things and consider information. And so the way we absorb information has certainly changed and, and combine that with polarizing candidates. And you, you know, you really have an, uh, an interesting mix there. Um, I think you add to that uncertainty is from a market standpoint. You know, we've seen a tremendous increase in the market over the last six, seven years. You know, from the lows of 2009, the market's almost tripled. A lot of investors are wondering whether, you know, is this the end of a great bull market and the start of something different or perhaps a continuation? But certainly an amazing period of time we're in. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think because of the, the bull market we've been in and the run-up we've seen in stocks, there actually is a lot of skepticism out there among investors, and investors are looking, you know, what is – what is the straw that's going to break the camel's back? And I think the presidential election is an easy one to point to because of the things that you mentioned in terms of, you know, social media. And we're just being inundated with this information. But look, let's first start by explaining what the markets are currently expecting to happen with this election. As it stands now, the markets are pricing in a Hillary Clinton victory. The expectation is that Clinton will win the White House, a Donald Trump victory uh, it would be seen as a bit of a surprise, though I have heard some analysts who think the markets are actually underpricing this scenario. But nevertheless, the current assumption is Clinton will win. The bigger question surrounds whether or not the Democrats can retake the Senate and perhaps even the House. Uh, both are considered lower probability events, uh, with the Senate being the more likely of the two options. But as it stands now, 
The markets expect Clinton to win the presidency and Republicans to main contr- uh, maintain control of Congress. If that happens, uh, then, Jason, from a market perspective, the thought is we'll continue to have gridlock. And the markets like gridlock. So this is a scenario that would be a relative positive. It could be. We'll, we'll have to see. But you're right that Wall Street likes the rules. That's gridlock. The rules to be constant, not to be changing. Anytime you introduce new legislation or something different, the rules change. And so that creates uncertainty. So, again, if we do have a a Democratic president and a Republican-controlled Congress, you may be less likely to see major legislation like minimum wage increases or a giant tax overhaul. You know, it also begs the question, you know, how in a in a divided uh, president in a divided situation like that, um, how can Obamacare be approved? You know that, that many will tell you that's a that's a that's a leaking ship right now. And there are tremendous premium increases around the country and it may need some tweaking. Um, if Clinton wins, though, the the consensus generally is that it's a in a in a large sense, a continuation of the current administration's general policies. So. Well, with that, whether whether you're a Republican or Democrat, the markets have moved up the last eight years. And so if you're from an investment standpoint, it hasn't been a bad time. Yeah, we've been in a, a lower growth economic environment. But you're right. The the stock market uh, has done extremely well. Now, the general market consensus with Trump. And again, this is not necessarily our personal views, just how the market is interpreting the election, uh, is that he would bring uncertainty. Now, remember, uncertainty isn't necessarily good or bad. You can have upside uncertainty and you can have downside uncertainty, but uncertainty does tend to lead to volatility in the markets. And since Trump is viewed uh, as somewhat of an outsider, it's not fully known what to expect from him in terms of policies he may pursue or or new laws and regulations. And so because of that, the feeling is there could be some short-term volatility if he's elected president. The the key word there, of of course, is uncertainty. But what do we really mean by that? It's about choices. You think of a situation where you're given three possible outcomes or choices, A, B, or C. I think all of us would be able to look at each one independently, you know, form some opinions, look at the data, and come up with a couple scenarios, likely, medium, and unlikely. What if there are a dozen choices? What if there are 200 choices? With that many options, that creates uncertainty. It's very difficult to assign probability when there are multiple outcomes. You know, many in Wall Street are in the prediction business, or at least they think they are, and they're in the modeling business for sure in terms of how companies grow and profits and things like that. You know, a perfect example of an uncertain outcome is the Brexit vote. You know, reminding all of our listeners, you know, just recently uh, the United Kingdom voted to exit the Eurozone, and the markets had it wrong, Nate, that, you know, it was widely assumed that it would not pass, you know, maybe perhaps in a narrow fashion, but that they would stay a part of the union. And that didn't happen. And the ramifications of that are still unfolding. How they will divorce themselves economically, um, monetarily, in a trade standpoint from the rest of the European continent has remain, will remain to be seen. Yeah, and we certainly saw short-term volatility uh, surrounding that decision uh, with the markets down substantially. Of course, they've since recovered. Uh, but look, all that being said, you do want to be careful not to get too caught up in the election from an investment standpoint. And that, that's what I really want to focus on today. I want to offer some historical uh, context here. But before I do that, Wisdom Tree who is currently the seventh largest ETF provider, they had a nice write-up uh, on the election last week. And they said, quote, the impact that 535 lawmakers and one president have on the economy is often far less than the economic choices made by 320 million individual Americans. And they go on to say that it's things like interest rates and corporate profits and the dollar and the price of oil. Those are the things that are going to matter longer term. Their point here is that the economy and corporate earnings and central bank policy, that's what drives the markets more than who wins the election. And if you look at what the stock market has done historically during election years, let me provide a few data points here. Uh, Charles Schwab found that the S&P 500 rose 81 percent of the time in an election year with an average return of 6.6 percent. Uh, interestingly, we're actually right at that number this year. The S&P 500 is up right at 6.6%. But the point is the markets tend to be positive overall in an election year. Now, I think what most investors are probably much more concerned with is what may happen next year, depending upon who's elected president. And with regards to that, if you look at the past 16 election cycles, 
going back to 1950, Charles Schwab found the S&P 500 finished positive in the first year of a presidential term only 56% of the time. So slightly better than a coin flip. And I think the takeaway here is, as you look out over the next year or so, trying to position your investments based on the election results, that appears to be a dicey proposition. At least the data certainly points that out. I think it's about choices. Investors and consumers have choices. Think of it this way. We all make hundreds, if not thousands, of very, very minor decisions throughout each day. We make medium-term decisions, perhaps as frequently, and then the very, very large, important decisions, buying a house, having kids, those sort of things, you know, on a, every couple of years, maybe. Well, if you, depending, regardless of what party you're in, if the opposition wins, are you going to buy less toothpaste when you run out? Uh, probably not. You want to brush your teeth. If, you, if your tire gets flattened by a nail, are you gonna, still going to fix it, or are you not because of some decision? Think of the thousands of small and medium decisions that really drive much of our economy just simply are going to go on. The wheels are going to turn regardless of who's president. So when it comes to the large decisions, will some of them be affected? You know, I think that's a possibility. I think it would be naive to think that nobody will make any changes at all depending on who's the president. But changes of the, of the large magnitude – don't happen that often, and they typically evolve over years. So I think the net effect here from a consumer standpoint is that, generally speaking, people are going to continue to live their lives. And from an investment standpoint, let's not get caught up in the short-term noise. Yeah, and I provided some market data for both the election year and the year following an election. But looking out even longer term, there's some great data out there. Let me start with a neat infograph Visual Capitalist had last week where they showed that since 1933, when Franklin Roosevelt took office, Every single presidency, whether it was a four- or eight-year term, has experienced positive stock returns. Uh, Even George Bush, who suffered uh, both the dot-com crash and the financial crisis, stocks were still positive over his two terms. And then Vanguard put together one of the more robust analysis I've seen uh, on elections in the stock market. And effectively, what they found was that stock market volatility does increase in the short term during the election year, just given the uncertainty. But then volatility stops increasing after Election Day. But more importantly, they have research going all the way back to 1853. And they found that stock market returns are, quote, virtually identical no matter which party controls the White House. So from 1853 to 2015, annual stock market returns were 11 percent, whether a Democrat or Republican won the presidency. And Jason, as a side note, they also found elections have no meaningful impact on uh, bond markets historically either. Those are amazing data points. They're absolutely counterintuitive. There is, a, I think, a set of beliefs out there, whether you're Republican or Democrat, that if the other guy wins from the other party, the market's not as going to do as well for me. And so Republicans may think that, Democrats may think that, and it's just simply not the case, and the data bears that out. It is important to keep our eye on the ball. What moves markets and what moves investments? You know, we've talked about it a lot this year, Fed policy. Central banks around the world have engaged in some amazing things. Um, I don't know if this time is different, but that's certainly moving markets. You know, and, and that involves, of course, interest rates. You know, we've seen the price of oil move up and down. You know, that has ripple effects across multiple countries, multiple industries. Of course, demographic trends as a nation – and as a world, we are aging as a population, and that has effects on health care and consumer spending, you know, productivity. You know, there's a battle in our economy to improve worker productivity. Of course, at the end, debt levels, personal and at the country. Um, how much are, are we indebted? How much have we how much how much, I guess, uh, consumption is have we pulled forward from the future from our grandkids to satisfy our needs today? You know, those are the kind of issues that keep us up at night. Yeah, and by the way, in that Vanguard analysis I mentioned, when talking about this data showing there's no difference in market returns based on who wins the presidency, they said, uh, quote, this is one more reason why investors should focus on more meaningful factors when it comes to their portfolios, such as diversification and controlling costs. And if you go back to what we were saying earlier, look, this presidential election is getting a lot of run. There's a lot of buzz on social media. There's certainly captivating news headlines every single day. And and certainly the candidates appear much more polarizing than usual. But at the end of the day, it is the economy. 
and corporate earnings and valuations and central banks, those are the things that are going to drive the bus here. And uh, Jason, isn't it funny that even putting those things aside, investment success never stops being driven by things like diversification and investment costs. And so I think the real takeaway here is don't let the election sidetrack you from, from what really matters most in your portfolio. This massive Vanguard study is a, an aha, but it's also a bit of a ha-ha because, you know, what do we talk about on this show? What what are the the simple ways that investors can put their best foot forward and immediately give themselves an advantage? How about lowering your cost? How about diversifying your portfolio? Sound good? Well, I think so. My takeaway also from this study, and I tend to agree, is that this is really liberating information. You know, if if we've let ourselves become a slave to the news cycle and Twitter feeds and what your Facebook friends are following, then we've lost the message here. I think it is great that we can take all of this noise off our plate, push it aside, focus on the things that matter. So I think this new information uh, should make investors happy and really crystallize the way they look at their investments through this through the short term volatility. All right, let's take a break here, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Tushar Yadava, investment strategist with iShares. While the longer-term market impact of presidential elections appears minimal, there could be some potential implications in the shorter term, especially if you look at the sector level. So we're going to visit with Tushar about some specific areas of the market that could be impacted, depending upon the outcome of the election. And we'll also talk about some of the ways you can attempt to minimize volatility in your portfolio. We'll do that right after the break. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Jason Lankin in studio today. I'm now pleased to welcome to the program Tushar Yadava, investment strategist at iShares. iShares is the largest ETF provider in the world. They're approaching $1 trillion in U.S. ETF assets, and they offer over 330 U.S.-based ETFs. Tushar is joining us via phone today from New York. Uh, Tushar, great to have you back on the program. Gents, thanks for having me back on. Tushar, in our first segment, Jason and I looked at some of the historical market data surrounding presidential elections, and what it shows is that there doesn't appear to be any real meaningful longer-term uh, impact based on which party wins the White House. Uh, however, in the short term, there is some evidence of additional market volatility around the election. And we also know that different policies and agendas from the candidates can impact certain sectors uh, of the market, again, especially in the short term. And I thought we might start with that today. As you look at U.S. stocks, are there any areas where you think we could see a shorter-term impact depending upon who wins the election? Uh, yeah, there's definitely some markets that you could say are pricing some results in or uh, moving with the sort of shifts in uh, in the campaigns today. I think it's important to, you know, just reemphasize the point that regardless of the candidate or even the election, um, policy manifestos tend to touch on sectors in a couple of ways, in, in spending or in, in regulatory ways. And um, in any way that you're looking at it, you've got to focus on what we know today versus the large amount of the unknowns, right? So we don't know the makeup of Congress. We don't know the candidate that's going to actually win. We don't know the extent of the policy even that they're going to be doing. So to, to be thinking about making shifts in your portfolio is there's a lot based on just those unknowns alone. With all that said, I think there's a few areas that we're looking at that we're sort of seeing those uh, impacts already today. Um, healthcare is an obvious one. I think the uh, Democratic platform um, is, is very much pro the sort of existing changes that have been put in place, uh, like the Affordable Care Act, um, and that's obviously going to be a central uh, point of the, the Republican campaign if, if they were to win. Um, and so we're seeing, you know, as, as the Democrats do better, uh, you tend to see health care is, uh, is, is sort of improving uh, versus uh, the, the opposite is when, you know, the Republican uh, candidate is gaining strength, you start to see um, health care maybe sell off or um, suffer a little bit. So there's some of that. Um, the, 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 the Democrats, you know, um, are more looked at in terms of putting into health care uh, some pricing power changes, some regulation, um, some spending um, sort of uh, changes as well. So that all could hit the healthcare sector and be negatively impacted there. Um, and the other side that we see is in financials. Um, you know, on both sides here, uh, there, there are real policy decisions that are being made that could, um, on the one side, impact regulation, 
uh, that could be, you know, on the, the Democratic platform, that could be a negative for financials. Um, on the other side, what you're seeing is uh, there could be very expansionary policies and much more sort of uh, hawkish views on interest rates from the Republican platform. That could affect um, interest margins and a lot of the financial space. So we've seen those two areas sort of move. You know, um, health care is sort of negative with the Democrats, and um, so is financials. And then on the Republican side, uh, we've seen the Republican candidate has had a very um, huge swing on uh, certain emerging market assets. So uh, the Mexican peso, for example, um, and Mexican stocks have moved very much um, on how well or not so well that the Republican candidate is doing. Um, and for both of them, I think, you know, trade is going to be a big issue. You've seen it come up in the campaign. Uh, when trade starts to uh, suffer, generally that's not a good uh, backdrop for emerging market assets, um, just looking through history. So, you know, th there's a few different ones there. I think the biggest one to sort of uh, step back and think about it in the long term, as, as you guys have been doing today, is to think about volatility. Uh, and that's one area where I think a lot of people can agree is that as we go through the last few days of the campaign, as we go through the sort of the outcome and how that plays itself out, um, volatility is probably something that we do think historically has shown that it rises and that as we go into this election, we do think will probably rise as well. Tushar, what about infrastructure spending? Because it seems like one of the few areas both candidates agree is that we need to improve our, our roads and bridges and other aging infrastructure in this country. Uh, is there an investment opportunity here? Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a tough one to look at in a lot of ways, right, because uh, uh, both candidates agree on it. Again, uh, you know, the devil is always in the details here. Um, so we haven't seen as much of that on the details. Um, also, what's important to know is we've seen run-ups in some of these stocks already today. So uh, I, I think you've got, to, you've got to understand that even with the most shovel-ready of projects, and that's what we saw in you know, 2008, 2012, is it still takes time for them to come through. You still need the details to emerge on how they're actually going to go about these spending. Um, and, you know, look, it, it's important, and, you know, fiscal spending and, you know, infrastructure spending has come up uh, mainly because of the, the sort of uh, the, the limits of monetary policy that we've hit. Um, and I think it's important to remember that, you know, it's very compelling to policymakers to look at the sort of fiscal multiplier and see how big it is at uh, the, the sort of lower interest rate environment that we're in. That's very appealing, but you've got to understand that you can't price all that in today. And so while there is some great infrastructure opportunities, you've got to make sure that you know what the details are, you know what the levels of the spending are. And just to give you, you know, I, I talk with a lot with clients, and I think that this is a really easy way to remember it, even um, – some of the biggest infrastructure projects that we've taken uh, in the past, right? So if you think about the Roosevelt era, um, the, the Hoover Dam, for example, in its day was less than half a basis point of GDP in terms of its actual cost to produce. So you need a lot of fiscal spending, and you really need to see those details emerge um, before you can really make a lot of investment decisions. But over the long term, um, there could be an opportunity there depending on the details. Again, we're visiting with Tushar Yadava, investment strategist with iShares. Uh, Tushar, you began to touch on this earlier in talking about uh, shorter-term volatility around the election, and I certainly think partly because of the election and also because of some other factors uh, such as the Fed policy and, and Brexit. We've seen investors flocking to low-volatility ETFs this year. Yeah. And one of the biggest recipients has been the iShares Edge Minimum Volatility ETF, ticker symbol USMV. Two questions here. First, can you just briefly explain to our listeners what this ETF is designed to do? Uh, and then two, there's been some debate about whether too many investors have piled into low volatility ETFs and perhaps pushed up valuations. I'm just curious, where do you stand on that? Sure, let's, uh, let's go one at a time here. Um, so the minimum volatility uh, solution uh, is our way of looking at taking uh, a portfolio of stocks. I mean, you mentioned the U.S. product, so I'll, I'll talk about the U.S. product, but we have products um, across, you know, uh, the, the global stock exposure across, the EM exposure across, the developed countries exposure. But for this case, we'll just talk about the U.S. Um, the, the, the U.S. minimum volatility approach is basically taking a portfolio of stocks um, that is designed to maintain a market exposure uh, with some stock caps and some sector caps but overall, what we're trying to do is deliver you market returns with less risk. And we try and define risk across a portfolio level. Now, what's happened is, you know, and empirically we can show this, 
And this sort of answers your second question, is what you've seen, minimum volatility portfolios have provided more return per unit of risk than some of the sort of large cap-weighted portfolios. So think about an S&P 500 or, um, you know, an, an all-stock uh, U.S. index. And to many, that, that's been very appealing, right? It's this idea of uh, capturing some of the upside, maybe not all of it, but being protected from the downside. And there's a lot of, you know, negative news flow, a lot of volatility in markets at the moment. And that's, uh, and that's really what's contributed to sort of having that investor nervousness. And that's what's pushed them towards this idea of, you know, trying to protect on the downside, but also participate on the upside. That's what's made it such a popular solution. Now, your, your other question about sort of valuation and, uh, and crowding, what we've done, and we've done a lot of sort of uh, research on this topic alone, is that it just doesn't seem to be borne out by the data. Um, minimum volatility ETFs have been shown to do that exact function, reduce risk, whether valuations are historically high or historically low. And, you know, that's what we come back to. If you're buying this portfolio uh, or this sort of ETF as a, as a portfolio solution to reduce your risk, um, that's the job that it's doing. Now, the other thing, you know, and you, you, you mentioned the word crowding, um, it's important to think about these portfolios in terms of the size that they represent. They're a very, very small fraction of the market cap um, and a very, very small fraction of the underlying securities. So any overcrowding concerns are a little bit hard to bear when, uh, you know, they're, they're less than half a percent of the overall stock market. And active mutual funds, for example, um, are about sort of 15 percent of the stock market. There's just, uh, there's just not enough of an ownership sort of um, needle to move there in terms of crowding. Tushar, this is Jason Lank. Uh, following up with Nate's question, um, it's my personal opinion that many of the reasons that the, the various premiums in the industry exist is because historically they've been hard to implement for the individual investor. Now every investor can take advantage of this concept with this ETF for 15 basis points a year. Just That's an amazing development. Yeah. Is, is, my question is, as the popularity continues and as the ease of access continues to improve, is there an arbitrage opportunity here? It, will the premium continue to exist as the way to take advantage of the premium becomes obvious? There's, yeah, there, there's a lot to look at in that, right? And, and I think what's important to think about is, you know, what, what have we designed this solution for? And we've designed it to sort of lower that risk. Um, and risk reduction in, in any way, shape, or form, you know, we've taken this minimum volatility approach to it, uh, you know, uh, over time, all you're trying to do is, is, is solve for that outcome, right? And that's what this portfolio is trying to do. You know, in terms of is there enough of an arbitrage opportunity or, you know, do you find these premiums? What we found is we create these, these factor, uh, these single factor exposures and, you know, all of our factor lineup looking at delivering long-term value um, with persistent long-term factors that show up across market cycles. This is one of those examples. Um, now, a function of the environment that we're in is when any asset outperforms or gathers a lot of flows, you suddenly start to get these questions, um, you know, be it from active management, be it from investors that are just asking sort of the logical question, has it gone too far too fast? Um, and that's, that's what we're seeing at the moment. I think when you step back and look at it, though, uh, all of these questions are about lower risk solutions. So, you know, it's not as though you're trying to sort of take more risk or you're really trying to really outperform the market. We're not saying that this solution does that. We're saying that this solution underperforms, or not underperforms, rather, it just lowers your risk, right? And so over time, it's not supposed to capture more upside than the market overall. So, you know, I think that premium, you know, that you speak of um, is maybe just a fragment, a fragment in time that we're looking at. And as we move through time, you know, generally the higher risk exposures will probably start to um, deliver higher returns. We're worried about lowering your overall risk profile and delivering you that better return per unit of risk. And so there's a difference there. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the market will probably, uh, as you start to see the sort of momentum slow down in the, the inflows and the attention, um, move on to sort of other areas of the market. And Tushar, just one last question on minimum volatility. When you look at something like the iShares MinVol ETF, uh, and, and obviously this is going to depend on an investor specific situation, but in general, do you view this as a, a one a core holding, and then two, does this replace existing U.S. stock exposure? Does it complement it? J just high level, how should investors think about this ETF in the context of their portfolio? 
Well, what we've tried to do is we've tried to construct this so that you maintain a market-like exposure. And that's why at the very, very outset I said we put stock caps and sector caps on it so that we don't just end up with a portfolio that's very weighted to a single sector or very weighted to a single holding. Now, the reason that we've done that and, you know, the reason that we've tried to deliver that in a very cost-effective um, manner is because we think that investors can position this at the core of their, core of their portfolios if they're holding it for long periods of time. Now, what it's going to do over that is going to give you market exposure. It's going to keep you invested in a similar sort of uh, sector stock exposure to the market, but just try and do it at a lower risk. So if you're one of those investors that has a very long-term horizon and is trying to um, take your risk down, this is a great way to implement it. What it's not is it's not a way to time the market and dial up and dial down your risks. Um, I like to talk about this when I talk with advisors as, uh, it, it, it's a market timing hedge. It just keeps you invested, and that's half the battle. And so investors that are looking at that and that they don't want to sort of weather the, the ups and downs of the market over short periods of time, those are the investors that we think have really flocked to this solution. Again, we're visiting with Tushar Yadava, investment strategist with iShares. Uh, Tushar, we have just a few minutes left, and since we have you on the line here today, yeah. I, I did want to ask you about the recent move by BlackRock to cut fees on 15 iShares ETFs. This included some very popular ETFs, such as the iShares Core S&P 500 ETF. And one of the factors noted for these fee cuts was the DOL fiduciary rule. Can you maybe provide some color here? This is obviously wonderful for investors. Is the DOL fiduciary rule the primary driver? Yeah, you know, this is a, uh, a, a, land, a landmark move that we've made to help advisors transition. And, you know, this is going to be um, a major shift in this DOL fiduciary rule. And so we're, we're helping them make that, um, make that transition by providing investors with a quality index exposure across our core lineup. And we're doing it at a great value that they can put at the center of their portfolios uh, for, for long periods of time. And, you know, this is just one of the sort of many enhancements and innovations that we're trying to make to help those advisors build better long-term portfolios for their investors. Well, Tushar, with that, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, as always, we appreciate you joining us on the program. Uh, and as it turns out, we'll be visiting again next week to spotlight the iShares Residential Real Estate Cap ETF. So we certainly look forward to that as well. Uh, thank you. Pleasure talking to you guys. That was Tushar Yadava, investment strategist with iShares. And you can learn all about the iShares ETF lineup by visiting iShares.com. And as I just mentioned, Tushar will join us again next week to spotlight that residential real estate ETF. That'll actually be part of a full show focused on residential housing and, and mortgages. We'll also be joined in studio by Timothy Noyce, who's a mortgage advisor at Finance America Mortgage. So if you're in the market for a house or to refinance your mortgage or you're just interested in learning more about investing in residential real estate, uh, this will be the perfect show for you. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have a very quick market update, and then Jason and I will spotlight the iShares Global Infrastructure ETF. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store. Show Nate Geraci and Jason Lankin Studio. Let's go right to our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. A positive week for stocks last week. The S&P 500 was up over a third of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up a tenth of a percent. And the NASDAQ was up nearly 1% for the week. And I want to spend just a few minutes today on the big news from over the weekend that AT&T is acquiring Time Warner for over $85 billion. Of course, Time Warner owns some very popular uh, content properties like CNN, HBO, TBS, TNT. They also own uh, Warner Brothers, the, the movie studio. And at the most basic level, I think the best way to think about this deal is AT&T already has the infrastructure to deliver content, right? They provide broadband internet into homes. They provide cable, mobile services. They also own Direct TV, And Time Warner provides content. And Jason, we could certainly spend a, uh, an entire show talking about this deal. But the bottom line is, he who owns content is king. 
And AT&T can now charge other cable providers for this content. They can make the content available through uh, their own streaming services or, or their mobile services and direct TV. And think about the competitive environment right now with somebody like Netflix. Netflix provides their own distribution platform, which is streaming over the Internet. But they also provide proprietary content. And that's been a very successful business model for them. Well, I think AT&T is taking this a step further because they actually provide the broadband internet and mobile services. And right now you have many consumers, especially millennials, who are cutting the cord. They're getting rid of cable. So I think this move by AT&T is clearly intended to both slow down this cord cutting, but also directly compete with other content providers like Netflix and, and Hulu in what is clearly a changing business model for the future. Think of all of the original content that's not on the three major networks. Uh, you know, HBO, Netflix, they're all coming up with content. You're right. It is king. And, and to be clear, Nate, th there's Time Warner, the media company, and there's also Time Warner, the cable provider. This is not Time Warner Cable. That's a completely different standalone company. This is We're talking about the media company here. Now, this is a big deal. This um, When you start talking, you know, almost a trillion-dollar merger – uh, there's going to be some scrutiny, and we are very early in the regulatory process. Th this will be looked at deeply by uh, certainly committees in Congress and watchdog agencies. Sticking with our election theme that we talked about in the first segment, you know, it's interesting. Donald Trump is on record that he opposes the deal. And, you know, and it's slight on details, but he's come out on a negative side. Hillary's running mate, Tim Kaine, for the potential VP, uh, has concerns. That's that's his his take on things. So I think everybody is going to take a long, long look at that. It, but it, it, it's it's a, to understand the bigger picture, though. Let's put at and move into context. You know, they are the pipe into a house. But if they don't have anything to put in the pipe, what's the company worth? How do we grow? You know, for many Americans who want a cable TV provider or a mobile phone, they already have one. And many, as you mentioned, millennials are going the other way. They're cutting. So how does a company grow that's in that situation? Well, you, you merge with someone who has something you don't. But I think as, as we peel back the layers, what strikes me as interesting is what does this say about the environment we're in? How, ideally, a company would like to grow organically, you know, ha have a higher spend from their existing customer and improve the size of their customer base. If you're not able to grow organically in AT&T's position where they feel like they need to make the merger – does that is there a parallel in other places? Um, you know, we're seeing it. We're focusing on the Time Warner uh, AT&T potential merger. But think about our industry, Nate, TD Ameritrade, Just Bought, Scott Trade. So two of the major brokerage houses in our industry. You know, this is a name many of our listeners are familiar with, Genworth Financial. You know, many people have life insurance, disability insurance, and long-term care policies. That company was just recently bought by a large Chinese firm. Yeah, there's a lot of M&A going on right now. It is. And so what we worry about is at when you start to see lots of M&A, it begs the question, where are we in the business cycle? Are we at the front of it? Are we at the mid of it? Or are we at the tail end of the business cycle? So while this individual situation between AT&T and Time Warner certainly deserves a lot of attention, it could be the canary in the coal mine for a lot of other companies. Well, and we need to take a break here, but I guess I'd also like to see companies investing more in growth for the future, making investments in, in plants and equipment and, and research and development, not necessarily just acquiring other companies. It's kind of like stock buybacks. Right. What value do they really add longer term to the economy? So uh, we'll see how this plays out. But there's no question there's been an uptick in mergers and acquisitions recently. We know that when it comes to job creation, small and medium sized companies are, are, are carrying the water for that. You know, when you look at large mega corporations, the net net of how many we hire and how many we fire, it's about even. So, you know, as we look at this environment, do we need more mega companies or do we need an environment that fosters small companies, startups, and entrepreneurs? You know, I guess the debate's wide open. Yeah, and again, I want to be clear. We're not saying just because there's been an uptick in, in M&A activity and, and you have some highly publicized deals that that necessarily means anything in particular for the stock market. But I do think uh, what it shows is that companies are looking for ways to grow. And, you know, why are you doing that? Well, companies are always looking for ways to grow. But also when you have an economic environment 
where that growth isn't naturally occurring, then you have to look for ways to grow. You have to look for ways to provide value to your shareholders. And so I think when you see this uptick in, in M&A, it should at least certainly get your attention. And th- this will be interesting to watch uh, unfold the AT&T deal in particular. As you mentioned, uh, Trump is on record of, uh, as opposing the deal. And, and Tim Kaine said he had some uh, some questions and concerns about it. Uh, but it'll also be interesting just to watch the broader uh, M&A space as we move forward. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll spotlight the iShares Global Infrastructure ETF. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Jason in studio. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF Store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,900 ETFs available for you to choose from. The ETF store sorts through and investigates them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the iShares Global Infrastructure ETF, ticker symbol IGF. And as we talked about earlier with Tushar Yadava from iShares, one of the few areas that both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump agree is that we need to improve our country's aging infrastructure, things like roads, Bridges, water systems, our our power grid. And so regardless of who wins the White House, there could be an opportunity to benefit from increased government spending on infrastructure. Well, one of the ways you can do that is by owning a basket of companies involved in building and managing this infrastructure. And that's exactly what this iShares Global Infrastructure ETF is designed to do. This is the most popular global infrastructure ETF. It holds 75 stocks. And as you can tell by its name, it is a global ETF. Only about 40% of this ETF's uh, holdings are U.S. stocks. But some of the top holdings do include U.S. companies, such as Kinder Morgan, Nextera Energy, and Duke Energy. And overall, if you look at the sector allocation, about 40% of this ETF's exposure is to transportation, 40% to utilities, and 20% energy. Year to date, the CTF is up about 14%, so it has done well, and, and Tushar hit on that earlier. It's currently yielding 3.4%, and its expense ratio is 0.47%. And Jason, if I could just connect some basic dots here, the government obviously has an interest, if not an obligation, in providing basic infrastructure for society and to make sure our economy operates smoothly. But also, if we have good infrastructure, this can perhaps improve productivity, produce jobs, and ultimately increase GDP and, and, and therefore tax receipts for the government. So if a government spends money on infrastructure, that could theoretically boost tax revenues. And it also clearly benefits companies involved in infrastructure, helping to improve infrastructure, which is where this ETF comes into play. I think you do have to connect the dots. You know, we'll see how strong that transmission mechanism is between shovel-ready products and greater tax revenue down the line. But several things stand out for me on this ETF. Number one, it is global. You know, we, we talk about shovel-ready projects in this country, but over half the exposure is outside the United States. I think that the yield is also very, very attractive. If you believe that infrastructure is a play, you're almost paid 3.5% yield along the way to wait for your thesis to play out. That's, that's pretty attractive. But, you know, infrastructure, airports, highways, ports, power grids, these tend to be more highly regulated parts of the economy. And and the way our thinking on this is that for people who believe in an infrastructure thesis, this would be a nice satellite holding. I don't know that you make this a core holding because you're certainly out there on at least a small ledge in terms of what you believe is going to unfold. It's also important to recognize, at least in this country, how how – Fiscal spending and infrastructure spending actually takes place. It, the government isn't going to um, hire workers and dig ditches and build highways. What they do typically in situations like this, it's similar to Medicaid in which they make block grants. So, you know, at the state level typically. So each state will come up with a list of projects that they'd like, you know, the government to help, you know, co-fund or fund. And then, of course, there's a large negotiation process, and then typically the government, the federal government, will then make block grants to the states to complete those projects. The states will then hire typically private companies. So at the end of the day, the American worker will benefit from this. But uh, make make no mistake, no matter who wins, Hillary or Donald won't be out there in a yellow hat uh, (laughs) fixing highways. It's going to be our friends and neighbors in the construction industry. You know, one other thing I, I think is worth mentioning here. 
you could make the case that when you look at central banks around the world, they're uh, out of ammunition. There's not a whole lot more they can do to stimulate uh, their economies. And so another way you can potentially stimulate an economy is through fiscal stimulus. And a piece of that could be governments around the world spending money to improve infrastructure. As I mentioned, that can create jobs, boost economic growth. And, you know, here in the U.S., both presidential candidates have voice support for this type of spending. So I just think high level, this could be a win-win situation. Infrastructure gets upgraded, which is obviously good for everyone. And, and there's been you know plenty of, plenty of studies out there showing that we need those upgrades. But this may also help boost the economy. I think the timing, at least from the interest rate standpoint, is important to recognize here. Because we don't have in this country a large piggy bank where we can cash in and help build roads. We're going to have to finance it, and we're going to have to borrow to do that. Well, we're in a very, very low interest rate environment, Nate. And if we're going to borrow money and fix roads and bridges, build, you know, finance projects that have the greatest social good across the largest, you know, swath of our population, now's probably the time. For the same reason people are refinancing their house to take care of lower rates, maybe it's a good idea, or at least the thesis would be borrow at very, very low rates and invest in our country. Yeah, and if you want to potentially take advantage of that opportunity, again, a good way to do it is this particular ETF, the iShares Global Infrastructure ETF, ticker IGF. We will have to leave it there as we are out of time for today's show. I want to again thank iShares Tushar Yadavra for joining us on the program today. And as always, just a reminder that all of our guest interviews can be found at the ETF Expert Corner at ETFstore.com. Full podcasts of the ETF Store show are also available at ETFstore.com, along with Apple iTunes and Google Play. You can connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store show. Next week, Tushar Yadava will be back on the program to spotlight the iShares Residential Real Estate Capped ETF. And we'll also be joined in studio by Timothy Noyce, Mortgage Advisor at Finance America Mortgage. We'll talk about the current lending environment, and we'll also discuss the housing market. Until then, have a great week, everyone. Same as the whole